Hello, welcome to the third part of the video lesson on the essay Structure, Sign and Play in the Discourse of the Human Sciences by Jacques Derrida. In the previous video, we talked about how Derrida points out using the work of the French cultural anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss the problems in trying to deconstruct the or question the concepts, the basic concepts of Western philosophy by using tools from Western philosophy. So the only way we can question Western philosophy is by using its own tools and concepts. And we saw this in much detail when uh, Lévi-Strauss was looking at the incest prohibition while studying certain kinship structures in tribes across the world. And he says that the incest prohibition is actually a scandal which questions the binary between nature and culture, a binary that is very central to Western philosophy and to ethnology as a discipline. And as a possible solution, Lévi-Strauss mentions a methodology that he calls bricolage, which is to use concepts, any concepts, as far as they are useful. So, use them for their methodological value without believing in their inherent truth value and to discard those concepts whenever they become useless or whenever new concepts arise and can be substituted instead. So, in this video, we will take this discussion forward and look at another work by Lévi-Strauss, which is also mentioned by Derrida. In the, towards the, in the second part of, or towards the end of his essay, uh, Derrida mentions one more work by Lévi-Strauss, which is The Raw and the Cooked, a study of South American mythology, in which he analyzes some 187 myths in a structural manner. By using structuralism, Lévi-Strauss uh, analyzes some 187 myths from South America, the South American region. And uh, Lévi-Strauss mentions that he begins his analysis with a myth called the Bororo myth. And he takes this Bororo myth as the reference myth. So the Bororo is the name of a set of tribal people living in Brazil and uh, Lévi-Strauss takes their myth as the reference myth to study all other uh, South American myths. However, he claims this reference myth has been arbitrarily chosen. So there is nothing very special about that myth. It is not like the Bororo myth is the origin of all the other myths, nor is it that it is exactly like it is typical of the other myths. So usually when we, in social sciences, when we choose something as a reference or as a key, you take a larger group, say you take uh, 50 people and then you take one of those people as a representative of those 50 people. It must be because either that person is the leader of all these 50 people, or that person is typical of all these 50 people. So that is how normally you choose samples. So Lévi-Strauss takes the Bororo myth as the reference myth, but he says normally this is what we think. We think that either this, we, we believe that uh, what we take as reference would have some special qualities, hmm? that it will be either the origin of the other myths or typical of the other myths. But here he says there is no reason why the Bororo myth should be privileged over the other myths. The only reason for its privileging is because he himself has arbitrarily chosen this myth as the reference myth. So where a reason on Noilla he has to choose any one. So he has chosen this myth. And because he has chosen it, now it is privileged over the other myths. Otherwise, naturally there is no reason to privilege it over the other myths. To choose this one rather than some other myth. And then he says, there is no unity or absolute source of the myth. So this myth cannot be the source or the origin of the other myths because... Myths don't have in any absolute source. 
myths are eccentric they don't have a center they don't have an origin their origins cannot be found we don't know who started a myth we cannot trace it back to find its origins unlike a text which probably always has an author myths are usually orally conveyed and their origins are lost in the mists of time so myths are eccentric in that way and so because myths are eccentric it is difficult to find a particular myth that is the origin or the reference myth so he has just arbitrarily chosen a myth and then he says that this is the problem this is the problem that levi strauss faces myths his object of study are eccentric but the language that he uses to study myths which is the language of ethnography or sorry ethnology or anthropology and it is based on concepts of western philosophy western metaphysics as we already mentioned and that language is a centered language that language assumes a center it is not an eccentric language so if you use a centered language to analyze an eccentric structure then you are perpetrating some violence on that structure you will not be able to understand that structure properly using a centered language to avoid that violence to avoid that problem the structural discourse on myth must itself be mythomorphic the structural discourse on myth must itself be mythomorphic this is an important point that levi strauss makes which is mentioned by derrida mythomorphic means having the form of a myth so the structural discourse on myth must itself have the form of a myth so it will start to resemble the object that it is studying and it will also become an eccentric language an eccentric an non centered language in order to analyze this eccentric structure called a myth so the structural discourse on myth must itself be mythomorphic and now having said this levi strauss then talks about the possibility or impossibility of totalization and he says that many people might think that this is not the right way to study myths you should analyze myths in their totality you should compile all the myths and then analyze them and that way you should choose as your reference myth something that represents the entire totality of myths but levi strauss says that is impossible it is impossible to get a totality why is it impossible the impossible uh, first of all there are too many there are too many myths that it is impossible to compile them according to levi strauss the totality of the myths of a people is of the order of the discourse that means there are as many versions of these myths as people who tell those myths because myths are orally transmitted and uh, even if they are recorded there is no guarantee that the recorded versions of the myths even if you write down the myths there is no guarantee that the, those are the only versions of myths or those are the correct versions of myths rather somebody else some old grandmother will tell the same myth in a completely different way so so long as there are people there are always different ways of telling the myths maybe the same person will tell the myth differently the second time rather than the first time aadyam parayna kadha avile randavathu parayumba kadha korchu kooti paraya that's also possible so that is why he says that the totality of the myths of a people is of the order of the discourse how big is the discourse that is actually the totality of the myths of a people and a discourse will never end discourse can keep on going somebody can keep adding to the discourse somebody can keep changing the discourse so you can never reach the totality of myths totalization according to levi strauss should not be a requirement so first he says total totalization is impossible because there are just too many versions of the myths now he says it should not be a requirement just as a linguist is not required or not able to compile the totality of utterances in a language before compiling a syntax so he says uh, structurally analyzing myths is just like creating a grammar of a language he is creating a grammar of the structure 
So when you create a grammar, you don't necessarily have to compile every single utterance, every single sentence ever spoken in a language. It is not necessary, neither is it possible. Just by taking a small number of uh, sentences, grammarians are able to compile the syntax. They are able to come up with the rules of the language. So totalization should not be a requirement for ethnology just as it is not a requirement for grammar. Thus, Levi-Strauss says that totalization is both impossible and unnecessary. Impossible because the number of myths is just too much, too many and unnecessary because it is not possible or it is not needed to do that. Rather, just like in grammar, if you have a set of utterances or a set of myths, you can compile the uh, rules of those just based on that small number. So, totalization is both impossible and unnecessary. And now, uh, Derrida points out that in Levi-Strauss, there are two ways of conceiving the limits of totalization that can be seen as existing simultaneously. Levi-Strauss in the work is ways of totalization the impossibility two ways of conceiving the limits of totalization that can be seen as existing simultaneously. First one is the classical style. So this is something that classical style people do but we can see an element of that in Levi-Strauss as well. What is it to say that totalization is impossible because the infinite richness of totality is ungraspable by a finite discourse. So the when you create rules etc then you are trying to create a finite discourse and the Totality, however, is much richer. You will never be able to completely grasp the infinite richness of totality, which is to say that there are too many myths or there are too many sentences and you will never be able to grasp all of them. So that is a classical argument and that is something we can see in Levi-Strauss. But Derrida says, post-structuralists also agree that totalization is impossible, but they have a different reason for saying that. And that post-structuralist aspect is also present in Levi-Strauss. The post-structuralist style is to say that it is not the extra number or it is not the large number of discourses that has a problem, but rather it is the lack of a center within a field rather than its infinite nature which permits free play and makes the totalization of the field impossible. So, you take any field, it is because of free play, it is because of the absence of the center that the elements can be in free play and it is because of free play that the structure keeps changing. So, it is the lack of a center which permits free play and makes totalization impossible. If the field is always changing, rather than being so large, the, even when you say that the field is infinite, the number of myths is infinite, you are not taking into account the fact that it is not just that there are so many, but that each, the, the myth just keeps on changing. The field keeps on changing. So this second aspect, constant change, which is made possible by the free play of elements, which itself is made possible by the lack of a center, that is pointed out by the post-structuralists and this element is also acknowledged by Levi-Strauss. And according to Derrida, free play refers to a field of infinite substitutions in the closure of a finite ensemble. Free play is a field of infinite substitutions in the closure of a finite ensemble. So actually the uh, the domain that you're trying to study might be finite but what happens is that within that finite ensemble within that finite structure the there are infinite substitutions of center for center which makes all the elements of that structure keep on changing this is what you call free play Thus, instead of being too large or infinite, it is precisely the lack of a center, the something missing from the structure which allows free play. And to refer to this, to uh, conceptualize this lack of the center, uh, this aspect of something being missing and something being always substituted for that missing center, Derrida comes up with a new term. 
and this term is called supplementarity. The aspect of a structure that allows free play by means of infinite substitutions of center for center is termed supplementarity. So supplementarity means that the original structure has a lack that needs to be supplemented with the addition of a new element. So when there is a lack, you have to keep supplementing it. You have to add something, some new element and adding that new element changes the entire structure. And then again, even if you add that element, there will always be a lack at the center. So you keep adding another element and it goes on and on and on like that. That is how supplementarity works. So supplementarity means the original structure has a lack at the center that has to be supplemented with the addition of a new element. But this itself is a contradictory idea. If the new element or the supplement, the new element is called a supplement. If the new element is an addition to the original structure, then it is superfluous. And the original structure was complete in itself. The new element is an extra fitting. It is superfluous. It was actually unnecessary. But if the original structure was complete in itself, then you cannot add something to it. You can't just add something to something that was already complete. If it is possible to add something, then it means that the original structure was lacking in something. Addition in the parimbo, or extra sadhanam in the light in At the same time, addition cheyam patumingilu, sadhan sikanam cadiam patumingilu, ah, original structure lendo, coro and dirno, a corolla salate canlo nam cadiam patulu. So, this is the double aspect of supplementarity. Hence, the supplement, while remaining superfluous to the structure, becomes the necessary element fulfilling a lack in the original structure. This is the contradictory or a paradoxical nature of the supplement. And this entire process is what Derrida calls supplementarity. We will quote from the text. One cannot determine the center, the sign which supplements it, which takes its place in its absence, because this sign adds itself, occurs in addition, over and above, comes as a supplement. The movement of signification adds something which results in the fact that there is always more. But this addition is a floating one because it comes to perform a vicarious function that is to supplement a lack on the part of the signified. So this is how Derrida explains the points that I've already uh, mentioned. The double nature of the supplement which is both an addition and therefore a superfluous uh, thing to the original structure but also so it becomes something necessary by virtue of the very process of being added to it. Now Levi-Strauss has also mentioned this idea of supplementarity and he compares the function of supplementarity to that of what we call a zero phoneme in linguistics. A zero phoneme is a term that was introduced by Roman Jacobson and other linguists to refer to a phoneme with zero pronunciation. And this is how Roman Jacobson and uh, J. Lutz uh, define a zero phoneme. A zero phoneme is opposed to all the other phonemes in French in that it entails no differential characters and no constant phonetic value. On the contrary, the proper function of the zero phoneme is to be opposed to phoneme absence. So this is the definition of a zero phoneme. So in while you study phonology and phonetics, you would have studied something like allophones, which are when the same phoneme is used but in different contexts. The, it sounds different, hmm? allophones of the same phoneme. But a zero phoneme can also be considered an example of an allophone. But what is interesting about a zero phoneme is that it, again, it has, it, you, you don't use a different character for that phoneme and its phonetic value keeps changing. But at the same time, so you can't say whether the phoneme is actually there or not. It is also contrasted to phonemic absence. It is not like there is no phoneme. But at the same time, you can't exactly tell what is the difference between that phoneme and what you usually use that phoneme for. So it's a very um, different kind of structure. And uh, you see zero phonemes more in French and not so much in English. 
it will be uh, simpler if we look at zero as a pattern in linguistics generally. So let us look at a something that is comparable to a zero phoneme but much more comprehensible in English which is a zero morpheme. Morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning in a language and uh, zero morpheme refers to a situation where the morpheme is present but it is not evident while writing or saying that word. So for example you take the word sheep the singular and the plural of that word is sheep. Sheep is singular, the plural of sheep is also sheep. So here when you look at the plural of sheep, there is a morpheme that has been added to it which is the plural morpheme. But it is not evident. The word does not change form. Therefore, the plural morpheme in sheep is an example of a zero morpheme. A morpheme is added but it is not evident. So this can be compared to zero phoneme also. Same logic applies there as well. A phoneme is added but it is not visible. Neither is it an absence of a phoneme. So just like that, supplementarity is just like that. You add something and it looks like it is something that is unnecessary and that is extra that is being added. But the uh, there is actually a lack in the original structure due to which you have to add this thing which then becomes not extra but a necessary supplement. So this is the general idea of supplementarity that is mentioned by Levi-Strauss and which is taken forward by Derrida. Now we will continue in the next video and we will complete this uh, the discussion of this essay in the next video. Thank you.